Zach here from Universal Air, and today we're gonna to be doing an install on this Liberty Walk C8 Corvette owned by Long from LT Motorworks. Zach here from Universal Air, and today we're gonna to be doing an install on this Liberty Walk C8 owned by Long from LT Motorworks. Today we will be walking you through how to do an install on the Airlift 3H system, utilizing our billet modular tank and a pair of the Viair 444 compressors. So to start out, I usually like to start with the air management system, especially if this is your daily driver. The air management is typically what's gonna take most of the time to do the install. So that way you can still use the vehicle if you need to and you can't really use the suspension as far as the bags go until you have the air management installed. So to start off, we're gonna go ahead and open up the frunk. And this is where we're planning on mounting it. For the air management system, we'll be doing our billet tank vertically in the middle, the 444 compressors on either side, and then the Airlift 3P unit down below. We will be using the height sensor upgrade, so we'll get all that wired up in there as well. We are doing a beauty plate to cover everything up to make it look real clean inside the frunk as well as give you complete access to everything underneath it. So to get started, we need to open up this frunk. We wanna take out that frunk liner to be able to mount everything into it. So to start, we're gonna go ahead and remove these top trim plastic pieces, and then this center piece is gonna come out, and then we can remove this bottom piece down here, and it'll give us access to the two fasteners on either side, as well as right here, there's a nut that's gonna be removed that's holding in the liner. After we remove this, that one, we remove this one over here, there's a couple 10 millimeter nuts under there, as well as the T30 screws on either side. With those fasteners removed, we do have one electrical connection right here. It does have a little red lock. You wanna make sure to push the lock away and then push down on the black release pin and it'll pop out. From there, we can go ahead and remove out the front liner and start prepping it. So our plan here is we made up this mount to secure the tank, the 3P valve unit, our air filter, and we're gonna mount the compressors onto the tank. So we've put four screw holes in the bottom, one in each corner, as well as the two screws that are gonna hold the tank to the bracket are also gonna hold to the frunk liner. So this bracket here will simply just slide down inside the frunk and we'll drill our holes. All right, now that we've got the frunk all drilled out for the bracket, we're going to go ahead and mount this 3P valve with those threaded holes through the holes in our bracket, straight onto there. So next we need to start thinking about how we're gonna get our electrical and our air lines into the front liner. This plug is the smallest end of the wiring harness. The other option is to try to fit this relay socket through, and that is larger than our plug. So what we're gonna end up doing is drilling a hole big enough to fit this through, and then afterwards, since the liner will be about here, we can have room for our four air lines as well as our two compressor inputs to come inside. All right, as you saw, we went ahead and cut this little hole. The carbide burr on the die grinder worked extremely well. This would be the way I would recommend. It just goes around. However, I would suggest doing some type of mask because we don't know what this is made of. It looks like some type of glass reinforced plastic. This is just barely large enough for the plug to fit through. And what I did was I measured from this hole on the bracket to the center of where the wire is going to come out. And I went ahead and laid it out on the back of this tub. So that way we can try and get this thing to go straight into the valve instead of being a little crooked or wonky. Now that we have the hole cut in the back of the tub, let's go ahead and get it flipped up and start assembling it. As you saw on the time lapse, we went ahead and secured down the bracket. We put the two bolts on the top here, as well as the four bolts down in each corner. And this is now secured into the tub. So what we're gonna do now is go ahead and assemble up the tank so we get that prepped to place inside of here. We also do have our wires coming through for the compressors, as well as the 3P is fully mounted. We're gonna go ahead and start putting our fittings into our tank. We will be using solid brass, as well as the DOT approved for our air fittings. Um, for thread sealant, I like to use the 545. 
We did do a video linked up above explaining how to tighten up the fittings and how to get them to seal properly. After we're all done, we'll go ahead and pressurize the tank and leak check all the fittings. The customer will end up painting this tank to match the car. However, let's go ahead and get it completely assembled up, leak tested, so that way we don't have to worry about scratching it. One of the cool features of our air filter is it does have a standard quarter inch NPT drain on the bottom. In our application, wherever this is inside the frunk, really not that accessible. We're gonna go ahead and remove off this quarter inch drain, hook up a regular fitting to quarter inch tubing and run that outside the frunk so that way it can be drained external from the vehicle. And then same thing on the tank, we're gonna run a airline from the lowest point of our tank inside the frunk and run an airline out to be able to be drained remotely. Now I'm going to go ahead and get the compressors all prepped. The way that they come, they have this little bracket for if you want to remote mount the air filter. Now we're going to end up screwing the filter directly into the compressor. So I like to go ahead and remove that bracket with these two little screws, put the screws back in. And then also something that drives me crazy is they come with directions for stickers right on the pump. We got the air inlet port right there. We got the warning about what type of thread sealing you're supposed to use, as well as the warning to not over tighten it. Once you put these in and actually start running them, this is gonna get hot and this is gonna end up discoloring and actually sticking more to the leader hose. So what I like to do is go ahead and remove all that off of there. I think it makes it look a lot cleaner. And when you do it now with the pumps brand new, you don't have to worry about the hose adhesive getting stuck onto the fittings. And then same thing on the end of the leader hose where the check valve is, remove that sticker and the sticker in the front of the pumps. I think it just gives it a lot better overall appearance opposed to seeing those little accents of white and silver all over the pump inside your install. Now we are going to end up rotating the legs around. So the leg originally comes in the front like this. So we're gonna go ahead and remove out these two screws. These two are longer than the other two because they have to hold the bracket on. So we wanna go ahead and remove out this one as well up there. And we do have to grind the corner of that leg just so that way it clears the head. And you wanna make sure the screws are going back on this way because that's what keeps this front cover onto the motor itself. If not, you're gonna have a very bad day. On that cover, you also have the cylinder. So if that's loose and it's wobbling like this, you'll end up snapping your cylinder or your piston off inside your cylinder. So make sure that your fasteners are coming in from this way or if you are gonna put the leg on the back side, make sure you put a nut to hold this front cover onto the motor. So there you can see the little bit that we clearanced off the top. That's how it was originally. We just clearanced it a little bit as well as the different lengths of the screws. The two longer ones are gonna be with the leg. The extra length in the screw is to account for the thickness of the leg. And then the one shorter one is gonna go into the compressor without the leg. But now we're gonna go ahead and bolt the compressor bracket onto our billet tank bracket. We're gonna utilize the Viair screws that they came with. Just make sure to put the lock washer on the top. Now we will be using some Loctite 242 or the medium strength or the blue. That way they don't loosen up over time. And then same thing on the compressor bolts, we're gonna use a little bit of blue Loctite in there as well. We have all the brackets attached to the compressors. We have both of the legs flipped to the side so that way we can mount onto the tank. We did mirror them right versus left because they will be going on either side of the tank. Let's get it assembled. And then from there, we're gonna go ahead and plumb in the leader lines into there. Of course, make sure you remove the little orange plug that they ship with to keep dirt out of them. All right, now that we have everything tightened up, we got the compressors connected into the tank on both sides. Um, we went ahead and plumbed in a way to inflate the tank up through our output for the 3H manifold, as well as for our drain, we just put a Schrader valve on there. So that way we can fill up the tank and leak test it. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna inflate up the tank. And go ahead and spray it down with some soapy water. What we're looking for is some bubbles like this. That would be, if we see a bubbling, we know it's leaking. 
So we go ahead and spray down every single fitting on here. Don't see anything standing out. Let's go ahead and flip it over. Let's check our drain. Now for the little small micro leaks, I usually let, like to let it sit for a little bit and come back in a few minutes and see if you see any little foam around the fitting. That usually means it's a real tiny, tiny leak. But everything here looks like it's sealed up good. Now it's been a little bit. If we give everything a good once over, we don't see any little foam on any of the fittings. That means that everything's gonna be sealed up tight. As a final leak test, I like to leave them up overnight and then come in the morning and see if the pumps turn on. That way you know for certain if you lost any pressure overnight. Now one thing we didn't do was leak check our air filter. So let's go ahead and fill that up as well and spray it down. Looks good, no leaks. Now that we got the filter leak checked as well as the tank and compressor assembly, let's go ahead and get that put inside the front liner. Okay, so we went ahead and mounted up the air filter to the bracket and we've got our remote drain line ran outside. We just left a few extra feet coiled outside. And then we have the output from our trap going into the second fitting on the manifold from the right. That's gonna be the air inlet from the tank. And then over here, we're gonna run this fitting over to our air tank itself. I'm gonna go ahead and get the tank put in, mount up. So we're gonna basically set the tank in on here and secure it with these two fasteners from the side as well as make sure we loop the wiring and the remote drain out over to the hole. Now, when it comes to dealing with the compressor wires, I personally prefer to use some of this PET expandable um, sleeve. You push on it and it expands and then you can pull it tight against your wires. It gives it a nice look. To secure it on the ends of the compressors, I personally use some silicone tape, but you could also use electrical tape and then cover up with some heat shrink. And I'll give it that final polished look. We got the front liner all prepped. We have the air filter line going out. We have the air inlet line from the tank coming in right here. Uh, I went ahead and pulled out the wires for the compressors because it looks like the wires from the compressor will reach out through that hole. We have our compressor wires all wrapped in the PEC sleeving on both sides. Now it's time to drop it in. Okay, here's everything mounted up. I wasn't able to get a shot of it while putting it in there. Uh, I was able to reach in through here with the 3 16 Allen wrench to secure the tank to the back bracket. And then reach down, plumbed in our quarter inch line that goes over to the air filter and reached in behind the tank to connect the drain for the tank. I was able to fish the wires out through the back side of the front liner. And then from there, we'll go ahead and complete all the wiring on the back side. And then a little sneak peek for you, we do have a cover panel that's gonna go over all of this. And there's the complete finished off look. All right, it's time now to clean up a lot of this wiring that we have. I wanna go ahead and pre-connect the compressors. This is from the 3H ECU over to the compressors inside the frunk, as well as start tidying a lot of this up because I'd rather do it here on the bench than up front inside the car. So we went ahead and finished up tidying up the back here. We made our connections to our compressors. Um, we are running the airless second compressor harness, so we do have two relays, which is the way, this is the way you should be running them because these relays are only rated for 30 amps. Really, you can't run two compressors off of one. One nice thing about the way that this system operates is it'll actually turn on the first one, let that voltage spike subside, and then it'll turn on the second compressor. Uh, we went ahead and cured up all the wires along the back here. Um, I trimmed these um, power harnesses that go to the battery because the battery is literally right next to this frunk. Um, this, these two wires right here are the ones that are going to go inside our cabin. And then this is our two remote drain lines that will get routed once we get it mounted inside the frunk. So now the only thing left to do is to get it put in there. Now I hope we haven't scared anybody away with this install so far. This is by far the hardest part of the entire install. The rest of it's just swapping out struts and running a few lines to them. We do have to mount up the height sensors, but with those brackets already pre-made, it's a breeze to do. So as long as this didn't scare you, you're going to be fine. All right, went ahead and got the front liner dropped back in. Want to make sure you fish your wires up right in here next to the battery cable. Um, this is our power harnesses coming up as well as our height sensor harness. For the touchpad controller and the ignition wire, we went ahead and fished it along the back of the front liner over there to the corner where it's going to go through into the boot. Um, I would recommend to have a couple people here to help you put this in place because it is very heavy 
and maneuvering it inside there does tend to be a little difficult. Um, now we can go ahead and secure it back in with the two screws on the side and the nut on both sides. And we'll move underneath and get working under there. Now on the bottom side of the car, we went ahead and removed off the underplating. It just held in with a bunch of screws up holding on the center cover. Um, this car did have a different lift system on it that we had to remove for them. So that's where the car is right now. For the front drain lines, we brought them out of our hole right inside there and brought it along this factory harness. Um, this is a wide body, so they don't have any inner fender wells. So we're going to go ahead and put, now when it comes to zip ties, please get yourself one of these tools. Last thing you want to do is leave a, use a set of side cutters on these and leave it razor sharp for the next guy. If you don't have one of these, take a razor blade and go right across the edge of the zip tie. That way it's not sharp, but these things make it really handy. The next step is going to be to put in the struts. Afterwards, we'll adjust the length to make sure we lay the car all the way down on the ground. To remove the factory struts, you're going to want to remove these two bolts on the upper control arm on both sides. Be careful, there is a spacer behind it, so you want to make sure you keep the spacer with the bolt and make sure you know which bolt goes into which hole because they are different lengths. From up above, you're going to remove the three nuts that hold the top part of the strut in. For the lower, you're going to remove this nut and pull out this bolt that holds on the bottom part of the strut as well as a sway bar connection for the rear. For the front, it's very similar. We have the three bolts that held the strut mount into the top. We also removed the upper control arm by the, moving the top two bolts on each side. And this will allow the arm to swing out and rotate around so you can actually remove the strut. For the bottom, we have just this one bolt that holds in the bottom side of the strut. This vehicle did come equipped with a factory hydraulic lift system. Customer has actually already removed it for the other system he had installed. So he went ahead and capped the lines and unplugged it. We do make a system for the factory struts so that way you can keep the hydraulic lift system installed so you don't get the air message on the dash. However, with this Liberty Walk kit, the cars just don't look low enough because the body kit itself is so high. On the Pandem kits, they're set up quite a bit lower. So on those ones, you can keep the factory magnetic ride as well as the factory hydraulic lift if your vehicle's equipped. The challenge is if you look at this factory body as well as the uh, wide body kit, the wide body kit is tucked up really far really close to the undercarriage of the vehicle. So for that reason, we need to go with the shorter strut, which is our full solution series, and then I'll make it get down quite a bit lower. So now that we have those lowers attached, I went ahead and put a block of wood underneath the ball joint so we can jack it up and get that top to line up. We've gone and done the same thing for the rear. We put a jack underneath the lower ball joint, compressed up the suspension in order to get the top to line up. We fed the three bolts in through the holes. And from the top side up here, we can put on the three nuts to secure it to the upper strut mount. And then to go ahead and tighten up the strut, we're going to tighten up this bottom bolt that runs through the spindle, bottom of the strut, and the sway bar end link. We'll run that in and tighten it up. Also, this would be a good time to double check to make sure your upper control arm bolts are tight on either side. Those should be removed in order to move the factory coilover. For the front lower, we're going to go ahead and tighten up this lower bolt that secures the bottom part of the strut to the lower control arm. Same thing. Double check your upper control arm bolts, make sure that these are tight. All right, now that we have everything installed for the struts, we have the top snugged up, the bottom snugged up. We need to adjust the overall length by lengthening and shortening this shock in the lower bracket. Now, if we just compress the strut up this way, the bag's gonna end up crunching in and it can actually damage the bag. So what we wanna do is we wanna put a little bit of air inside of it. So I just use a little blow gun like this, or you can use a regulator. If you take a look at it, the bag itself looks kind of crunched up. And if we were to actually compress it this way, the bag would end up getting pinched in between the top and bottom cap and actually damaging the bag. So what I like to do is put a little bit of air, not too much where you can be fighting it to lift the car up. Just so that way it forms like that. And what that will allow it to do is it will make this part roll down on the bottom instead of crunching it up on the top because this has air inside of it. If you put too much air in there when we go to jack it up, we'll end up lifting up the car. So what we have done here is we went ahead and put the suspension up on a jack stand and we compressed it up so that way the from the center of the wheel all the way up to the first thing it hits, which is going to be this uh, plastic cover on the top, is just at about 13. The tire size on this is a 265 30 20. So the overall is 26.3. Um, so we go to a 13 inch from the center wheel to the, from the hub to that top. At that point, we put a tape measure on the top part of the bag 
and we look down on the bottom side, right where this flange is, so right at about five and a half inches. In our instruction sheet here, we're showing that from that top flange to the bottom flange, it should be at four and an eighth. So being at the five and a half, that means we have to lengthen our coil over to collapse the bag more at that same height. So by taking that measurement, was the five and a half, and we need to be at four and an eighth. So that means we need to lengthen this section right here by inch and three eighths. So what I do is I go ahead and measure from the bottom side of this 90 degree plate to the top side of this lock nut, which was just under three eighths of an inch. So then what we're gonna do is remove the airline coming off of the bag, and then we can just simply loosen this up and rotate the whole strut to lengthen it up. So with this loose, you can just keep going and then if you want to measure underneath from this bottom lock nut to your bracket, you go into that's the length we need, which in our case is an inch and three eighths. Now we've gone ahead and adjusted the threaded body shock. So we have the inch and three eighths between there. We can go ahead and thread this all the way down, snug it up, and we're going to compress the suspension up after putting a little more air in the bag and double checking our bag height. Okay, what we've done here, we went ahead and lengthened that lower coilover bracket off of the shock body to make this strut longer. And now that we have it compressed up, we're at the four and an eighth with the fully compressed. Something to keep in mind is when you're compressing it up, you will be increasing the pressure. So what I like to do is feel it and if it's got a little bit of squish, we're good. If it starts getting really hard, I usually like to let a little bit of air out because as you decrease this volume, your pressure is gonna go up. And if we still measure up from our center of our wheel, we're at the 13 and change. And that's all the way up to the top side. We can always adjust it later if we need to by lengthening and shortening this bottom. However, I, you wanna get your height set properly before you start doing your height sensors. Because if you're gonna change this a lot, your height sensor linkage is gonna have to change as well. Now that we got that measurement set, we can go ahead and measure the gap here. I like to go from the bottom of the plate to the top of the lock ring. And this one is 1.84. And we'll go ahead and match that distance for the other side. We've gone ahead and done the same thing for the rear. This is actually be the lowest point is the rocker panel, the inner fender well area up here. There's plenty of space. So we went ahead and jacked up the suspension to simulate where we wanted to be at fully dropped. And when we measure from the top of the bag down to the flange, we got six and an eighth. So that means we gotta lengthen the shock by two inches. So once again, we'll go ahead and crack this bottom nut loose, remove the air line going into the bag, and then lengthen it till we have two inches between the nut and this lower bracket. Gone ahead and lengthen it, um, secured this bottom jam nut, and we check our overall length, and we're right at four and three eighths, as far as the gap from the bottom of the bag to the top of the jam nut. So with that, we'll go ahead and go over to the other side and match it up. Okay, so to lock down the coilovers, we take the spanner wrench, put it on the lock nut, snug them up. I like to go ahead and tap this right here with a rubber mallet to make sure that we get this thing extra tight. Because if this part is loose, you're gonna get a rattling noise in your corners. A lot of people ask if this is even necessary. These bags are designed to ride a certain way at a certain height, and they're designed to get firmer the last bit of travel to prevent you from bottoming out, especially when you're driving really low. So if you don't take this step and adjust the overall length, you're gonna be sacrificing your ride quality because when you're at your ride height, that means your shock's gonna be a lot further extended than it needs to be. What will happen is when you're going over your potholes and bumps, the wheel can't fully fall into those holes because the shock's gonna to top out. So you wanna make sure you take this time to adjust the length for your particular application, your wheel and tires, what will clear, what won't, if you have wide body or not. So definitely take the time to adjust these shock lengths because it'll greatly improve your ride quality and overall happiness. Now it's time for us to talk about the part everybody dreads, height sensors. It really isn't that hard, especially with the brackets we made for it. However, let me show you a few of the challenges that might help you in your application. Now one thing I always find very challenging is with the airlift sensors, they give us three different adjustment holes. They suggest for the first hole is if you have two and three quarter to one and 13 sixteenths of travel. Second hole is four and three sixteenths to two and seven eighths. Third hole is five and five eighths to four and three sixteenths. Now what always bothers me is here is the height sensor arm. We, give, we have three different holes to work with. Now what happens when we need less than the inch and 13 sixteenths of travel? Or if we want to get an actual tighter range? What we've done is we went ahead and made up 
these arms that have multiple adjustment holes on them. That'll give you a lot more fine tunability as far as to set your sensor rotation, suspension travel we have available. Now for the C8, what we went ahead and did is we made these very specific front and rear height sensor arms. They are a little bit different, but the reason we did these was to, we want to go for the absolute perfect height sensor sweep adjustment available. So if we take a look within their manual for their height sensor install tool, they do give us a range here of basically 80 degrees to 100 degrees is their ideal position that they want the height sensors in. They will accept from 60 to 120. However, this green band is their more ideal section. With these standard arms, what drives me crazy is that you might be in the first hole and be traveling too far because the closer you are to the pivot, the more rotation you get with your suspension movement. And if you're in the second hole, it might not be quite enough. So that was the main advantage and why we actually produced these. Um, it gives you more fine tune adjustability as well as sensor locations a lot closer in towards the pivot, which you need for when you have a really when your sensor location is a lot closer towards your pivot, and hence why we made these. As you can tell, it's a little bit shorter than the smallest hole on the front, and it's even more short on the height sensor arm for the rear. This was because we, our goal was to target this green range. This will be the absolute best for the Airlift 3H sensors. However, like I said, they will accept the greater range of the 60 to 120. To actually mount them on the vehicle, what we did is we made up these brackets that'll go into existing factory holes. And the sensor is going to bolt on for the front. And then for the lower, we have an existing tapped hole that we're going to bolt this sensor into to have the linkage connect from here up to the sensor. For the rear, we remove one of the bolts off of the sway bar bracket, put this on there to lo locate the sensor. And for the rear lower, we have this little tab that's going to go into the factory arm. We'll walk through all this and showing how we actually set the length of the sensor linkages and help show that a little bit better. And prep up these sensors, what we're going to do is we're going to start by removing the three screws that hold on the factory arm. And we're going to start out with the front sensors. So we put on the new sensor arm. We have these little screws that we provide for it. Now there is a little pip on the arm that lines up with the pip on the plastic sensor body. You have this rotated off, because this can go on 90 degrees or 180 or 3, 270 around, then it's going to not be reading in the right direction. And to mount the sensor on the bracket, we provide some new hardware. We go through there. They're secured on the back with a nut. And one thing I prefer to do is to put this screw in the middle of the range that'll give us the best travel because we can rotate the sensor a little bit if we need to fine tune in our travel. It's time to put together the rear. We go about the same way. We remove the three screws off of the factory height sensor arm and we get our sensor arm labeled R for rear. Line up our pips on the back as well. And secure it down. When it comes time to mounting them to the height sensor, we go about the same way. The sensor is going to be pointing towards the bolt that secures it to the vehicle. And the same thing, I like to line them up to give us that adjustment range. side. So now that we have the bracket all attached, I like to go ahead and put on this end of the linkage. We put the screw up through there, put the spacer washer in that we provide. 
do the rod end and then the nut. So when you go to tighten this up, you want to make sure you tighten it up snug, but not so tight that you're going to start causing the ball to bind. On the airlift linkage, they do use the uh, metal ball inside there, so it shouldn't be as bad, but we want to make sure we don't overdo it. When I tighten it up too much, this thing starts binding. So if we go ahead and loosen a little bit, it makes it free. You want it to be tight enough to get accurate readings, but not so tight that it's going to cause it to bind. That's going to be it for the rear. Go ahead and add it on the front. Once again, we put the spacer in there, and we're going to attach our rod end. So there, it's too tight. Let's loosen it a little bit. And now it's back free. Now to mount the sensors up, we're going to remove this ball right here, and we're going to put it through the hole in the sensor bracket. That's going to make the, mount, the sensor mount up right there. For the front, we've gone ahead and made a bra the bracket fit up. We're going to be utilizing this hole right here and then fastening that right like that. Now we do also have the leader hose mount that goes in with the same screw. We'll get that on there and show you how it goes. So we have our height sensor brackets mounted on the vehicle with the height sensors in. And while we're in here, let's go ahead and install our leader lines. We made up these little mounts that'll go on with the up, one of the upper control arm bolts to point the hose straight down underneath. Okay, and then for the front height sensors and mounts, here's our leader hose bracket. It's gonna be a little hard to show you up inside there, but we have this hole that the screw's gonna go through. And then on the height sensor bracket as well, and these two will go through the same hole and then tighten up into the car itself. So that's gonna sit in there like that. The leader hose, or the linkage for the height sensor is gonna be there, and then there's the leader hose gonna run over to the bag. So right here is a single screw that's holding on both the leader hose as well as the height sensor onto the factory cross member. That is a factory tapped hole. And now our front leader hose bracket is secured along with the height sensor mount with the one screw underneath here in the bottom. We do align this up with the cross member as far as to get our orientation straight. So for the rear bracket, it's secured with the bolt up for the sway bar bracket, as well as these locating features on the bracket to bring it over and up. So that way it'll clear this rear toe link. And then we're gonna connect our linkage from here down to the lower control arm. For the upper hose, we made this little simple bracket to go on with the upper control arm mount to secure it up here. And we wrap the hose around, lead it into the bag. All right, now it's time to actually do the height sensor linkages. Um, one of my customers, Sal, over at AirRide Equipment, originally told me about this idea. Is you actually print out a copy of their little diagram, and then you cut out the bolt holes onto the template here. And we can go ahead and stick it on our sensor. Okay, we went ahead and stuck the paper template onto the sensor. We went and rotated the arm to the bottom green section because the suspension is fully extended or fully drooped. Um, I've mocked up the bottom ear into the, the linkage onto the lower bracket. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and mark the bottom side of this rod end on this all thread, and then we'll account for what's threading into the rod end, and we'll go ahead and cut down this all thread to length. So the way I like to do it is I thread this all thread into the rod end until it fully bottoms out, and I tighten the two nuts up together, and then that way we can remove it and this is the amount we need on our other all thread section to go into the actual bracket. Okay, I'm not sure how well this is gonna show up on video, but right there is the mark we made for the bottom side of the other rod end. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna line up the end of the all thread with the mark, and then we'll go ahead and mark it right here before we have to cut it. Now with that secondary mark on there, we'll go ahead and cut it off right there, and our all thread length would be right for this front corner with the way we have these front struts adjusted. So I went ahead and cut off the all thread, went ahead and hit it on the belt sander, did a quick little deburr on it, and now we can go put in this front linkage. We do want to put the two jam nuts that Airlift uses on there, that way we can fine tune it exactly how we want it. Okay, I've purposely done this linkage too short, because I wanted to point something out to you. If you look at the angle between the linkage itself and the arm, this angle of the linkage and this angle of the arm, you can see they're almost directly in line with each other. With this linkage and this arm in line with each other, there's a high probability that your sensor linkage could cam over and go the wrong way possibly causing damage to your sensor or breaking your linkage. And also, if you look here on our little chart, we're definitely down in the bottom red section. This is what we want to avoid. Now, if we simply lengthen this linkage up a little bit, it's going to rotate the sensor up and be back in our green section, or at least in the yellow, 
if you guys are doing this on your own. That And also this linkage and this arm will no longer be in line with each other. It's gonna be at like a, an angle between the two. That way, even though the suspension's fully hanging, it won't ever have the potential for it to cam over the other way. Overall, this is what I like to see. There's a little bit of an angle between the linkage and the arm, so we don't have to worry about it camming over. All the linkage is tight. I tighten up the jam nuts on either side, as well as the plane that this lower heim and the upper heim is on is in line with the pivot of the control arm. That way you don't have to worry about angling these joints back and forth as you're going up and down with it. Now the only thing left to do on this side is to hook up our airline to our bag. Okay, our height sensors are now installed with the linkage set properly. Our airbags are connected up. This wheel is completely done. Now we got three more corners to do. Now some of you might be wondering what these little spacers are used for. And what these are is if you need to space your height sensor out a little bit to get your linkage to line up. So if we take a look at this linkage, we do have a slight offset. Now we can bend the all thread in order to make these two line up, but this lower mount is shifted this way because the suspension's hanging. As this thing compresses, it's going to move back a little bit, whereas this upper height sensor is not going to move at all. So what we can do is we can use that spacer behind the sensor to bring it out a little bit to get this better in line with each other. Okay, the way we're going to put those spacers in, we're going to move the sensor off of the bracket. And the spacer just slides over the bolts. It sits in there like that. and we're gonna put it back onto our bracket. We wanna make sure we go ahead and put it in our center of our adjustment range. There we go, and also for a sanity check, the back of the sensor would be flush with the back of our bracket so we know we're square. So with adding that little spacer in there, you can now see they're pretty much straight in line with each other. So now that we have our spacer on our height sensors, Along with the paper template back on there, we're going to line the arm up in the green section and go ahead and mark the all thread with the bottom of the rod in. Okay, as you can see, we got our mark right there off the vehicle. We'll go ahead and use our same all thread with the double nuts and go ahead and mark the spot where we're actually gonna cut it off at. Okay, we got our second mark on here where we're gonna cut it off the all thread at. Now, it should go without saying that this is the amount of thread engagement inside these ends. So if we're a little bit shorter than that mark is where I typically cut it at. And then we use these second nuts to lock the all thread against the rod end. So after you cut off the all thread, if you take it to like a belt sander or a flap wheel and you just kind of turn it like this, you can clean up the chamfer mark or the cutoff mark on the all thread. And then you can test it into your rod in here. Once you get it cleaned up, it'll thread right in. Now Airlift does ship these height sensor linkages with this, almost like a silicone tube. If you want to put it back on here, you can put it on there, measure about what the length is, go ahead and cut it. Don't cut your fingers off. And from there, you slide it over the all thread and tighten it up. Now after you do that, you want to put it on the vehicle and we adjust the overall length of this linkage so that way we get right in there our green section. Okay, we got our height sensor linkage all connected and adjusted it right in the middle of our green section. Went ahead and secured down the lower bracket as well and the nut for the linkage. Now we have to go over and do the other side. Now if you're doing this by yourself and you're not using our brackets, you don't have to go into the green. The yellow is generally good enough for it. However, I always try to make everything as best as absolutely possible. Now, after this, you're gonna to wanna to cycle the suspension all the way up to make sure that your compressed height is still within the right range. In our case, we're looking for the green. However, as long as you're within the yellow, the system will function. Here's our final sensor installation on the front. With the suspension fully drooped, we are right down in the green section for the extended position. And then when we compress it up, we'll be, we are right within the green range on the compressed position. There really isn't a good way to get up in here once everything's compressed to show you. Just to assure that the geometry it's been set up on all the bracketry in order to achieve the sweep from green to green. However, we do suggest to double check it. And for our final install on the rear, same thing. We're right in the green section for the extended position, as well as up here in the green section for the compressed position. Now it's time for us to finish up the wiring for our main power into the ECU, along with making our connections to the height sensor to the brain. All right, now we have the height sensors all mounted up. See, it wasn't that hard, especially with the brackets. 
Now we gotta start working on the wiring and plumbing. All right, something that's very important to know here is that this is nylon tubing. The way that the system works is there's an O-ring that slides over the outside of it. So when you're running along the vehicle, you wanna make sure you don't put any big gouges inside of it because if you do, you can, that could be a leak point right there. So what I like to do a lot of the times is actually wrap this up with either like a blue tape or something like that so we don't have to worry about gouging it as we run throughout the vehicle. Now something we need to talk about in regards to this airlift harness, here's the sensors for the front and here's the sensors for the rear. Generally, most people will put the, the 3P manifold in the back of the vehicle and our application we're putting it up in the front. So because of that, the rear height sensor harness is longer than the front, so we're gonna have to switch them. So we're gonna do the one that's actually labeled as the rear left. We're gonna run this to the front left. And the one that's labeled as the front left, we're gonna run that for the rear left. Now my preferred way to run everything is to just get it loosely ran through the vehicle like we have it now. Everything is just kind of draped in what in the about the area we want to run it in. From here I'll go through and secure the harness and the airline all the way up to the front. Now for our tubing and wiring, so we went ahead and ran the wiring harness for the height sensor up to the bottom side of the chassis where the factory wiring harness is. And then along the bottom side of the chassis on the harness, tied in the airline, and brought that all the way down over the cross member along the same harness. Ran it on down, or we tied in with the passenger side. Ran this down the tunnel. Up to our cross member, we took it over, and went into the front liner. For the front, it was a lot simpler. We just brought the airline and the harness along here, ran the airline inside the front liner, tied all four of the harnesses together, and ran it up to the top where the other connector is. All right, as you saw, we went ahead and fished up our height sensor lines. We're gonna go ahead and connect them up to the um, height sensor connection for the ECU. Just remember that we swapped the front versus the rear, so we're gonna wanna match the rear labeled sensor up to the front, corner sensor if you will. Uh, we went ahead and fished over the, the display and the ignition turn on. We're gonna go ahead and fish that inside next time we take the car up. We've also pulled back our air lines to go into our 3P manifold. We'll go ahead and get those secured up underneath and then get them put back. Alrighty, we went ahead and tidied up the wire harness in for the height sensors. And now we got to trim back our air lines and connect them into our manifold. And with that, our wiring is done. We went ahead and secured our ground lug here to the battery directly, as well as the positive lug went directly to the battery right here. I tucked all the wiring up behind the trunk liner so that we can't see it. And then we do have our fuse holders right over here where they're easily accessible. So I couldn't take it anymore. I had to paint the plugs black. Customer is gonna end up painting the tank to match the body color. But for now, at least, they're not sending out like two little sore thumbs. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and put the fuses inside the, the fuse holders right there. And then we're going to connect the pink ignition wire directly to the battery. Now that we have all the connections made at the battery, Let's go ahead and air the system up and do a leak check at all of our bags. One thing I'm not sure if you guys remember, we did do a remote drain for our air tank and for our air filter. One nice thing is we can actually just put air inside of here from our shop air to give the compressors a nice starting point with the shop air inside the tank. So now that we've connected that pink wire, the compressors are running and we're into our setup menu. We're gonna go let the tank fill all the way up and then put a little bit of air inside the bags. We wanna do this in English so that it's not calibrated but we wanna just go into the menu. If we look here, we're at 129 PSI as far as the tank pressure goes. So now that the compressor finished filling up the tank, let's go ahead and put some air into the bags. We just like to put about 100 in there, just so that way we can find the leaks fairly quickly. Okay, now let's go spray down all of our connections and make sure it's all tight. And now it's time to check our connections. Spray them down with some soapy water. And what we're looking for is to see if there's any bubbles. Don't see anything there. Let's check our line. Don't see anything there. We'll check the other one from the other side. Here in the back, let's check our leader line connection to our bag, as well as our fitting connection. No bubbles there. Check the other side. No bubbles. One more to go. Finally, let's check this front right. 
Nothing there. We have one final connection to check is on the other side of this leader line because we can't see it from this side. Our final connection to check is right here where the fitting goes into the bulkhead. I've gone ahead and sprayed it down. We can't really get the camera up there to see, but using my phone, you can actually see up in there and make sure there's no bubbles. This side's good. This side's good as well. And now our final place to check is our connections where the airlines connect to the manifold. Not gonna be able to see it in there, but I'll go ahead and spray it down and, and double check it. So once again, using the cell phone and the light and camera, we can check those to make sure there's no bubbles coming out. And we are good. Now to get our USB cable and ignition wire inside the cabin, up here in the front passenger side wheel well, up underneath this little inner structure, there's a boot that will allow us to pass the wires from the outside of the body inside. What we're gonna do is we're gonna cut a little slit inside the rubber boot and push these wires through. So here's that little rubber boot. We're just gonna do a little slit inside of it and run the wires inside. All right, now that we have the wires fished through the boot, we're gonna go ahead and drop these wires on the interior and we'll catch that on the inside once we get the vehicle down on the ground. Now it is important to note that we do have these bags filled up. You wanna make sure you have air in the bag so that way you can get the car off the lift, otherwise it can be too low. And with that, we're in the home stretch. We're gonna go ahead and get the car button back up, put the fender liners back in, along with the bottom pan, put some wheels and tires on it and set it down. Time for the home stretch now. You gotta go ahead and button everything else underneath here. Got the wire connectors all hit nice and hidden. We're gonna go ahead and bolt the tub back down to the body, put our cover panels back on here, and then go ahead and do our cover plate for the air management system to make it look clean. Right, I've gone ahead and removed the dash so that way we can actually see what's going on in here. So for the when we came through the boot, it, the wires poked out right up here through the top, which you could reach from underneath. We're going to go ahead and get our ignition source right here off of the 12 volt accessory port um, for like charging your cell phones. It's the purple wire, which is going to be the switch key to ignition. And then for our USB cable for the display, we pulled off the side panel here where we're going to run it along through here. And then from inside the glove box or the center console area, we drilled in that bottom corner so we can peek the wire out through there. So that way the customer can keep this closed and you won't see anything inside. Now, if you guys do want to drop down the glove box like I did, first you start off by pulling off this trim piece right here. It's held in with the two snap. Then you pull off this corner piece, which is held on with two metal snaps and a couple guide pins. From there, we have two screws, one right there, one right there. Once you remove those, and down below here, down below the bottom, we have five screws along there inside the glove box we got the one torx right up here you will need to remove this bottom trim piece which just snaps out with the metal clips and then for this panel right here there's a single bolt right there once you pull that off you're going to grab it over here pull it out and slide it back this kind of slots into the side of the glove box so you want to make sure you pull that out afterwards the rest of this glove box is just held in with pop pins all right we got all the panels snapped back on there we got one more left to go. There we go. After showing the pictures to the customer, he decided he wanted to not go all the way down to the ground. So what we've done is we put the car up on some two by fours, so that way we can measure how far off the ground the rocker panel is. And then from there, we can adjust the shocks. Okay, so with this thing sitting up on the block, I'm seeing an inch and three quarter in the front, right about two inches in the back. So that means as of right now, when we lay it out, this right here should be a quarter inch off the ground. He was asking for a half inch off the ground. So what we're gonna do is we're going to lengthen the shock. So when we measure from the center of the wheel up to an inner structure, we want this to be a quarter inch longer than it is right now. Okay, so we have the rear end up on the block as well. If we measure down here, we see an inch and a quarter off the ground. However, deep underneath here, we're closer to about half inch off the ground. So that means we're gonna have to lengthen this rear end up by an inch and a half in order to have this back corner back here be 
a half inch off the ground. So typically you don't have to go through this step. Usually the car doesn't go down this low. However, with the body kit hanging down below the factory body, we want to make sure we don't crush it, especially a Liberty Walk kit. All right, we got the car back up here on the rack. So we're going to go ahead and disconnect the linkage off the height sensor because we're going to change the length of the overall strut. And that's going to make that sensor rotate too far downward. After that, we're going to crack this bottom nut loose, disconnect our air line, and then we can actually measure from the center of this wheel hub up to the inner structure. And we know we want to go that quarter inch longer for when we're fully extended so that'll raise up our drop height by that quarter inch and of course after talking to the customer he decided to change it from a half inch off the ground to an inch so we went ahead and adjusted to three quarter inch longer so we get that um, one inch off the ground when it's fully laid out and of course if you take a look here with the linkage can't even reach it all the way down to the bottom we're way too far down so we're going to go ahead and lengthen this linkage right here and that's going to move us back up into the right range of travel we should be right there in the green section all right he went ahead and got the linkage adjusted we're back in the green range we had to lengthen this arm in order to account for the extra length we put on the strut to get the car to lift up higher as well as to make the car not go as low. Now with this all adjusted, we're gonna go ahead and measure this and go over and put it on the other side. So as you saw in the time lapse, we went ahead and disconnected the height sensor linkage. And then we cracked this nut loose, disconnected our hose and turned the shock in order to lengthen it. Now, being as that we are fighting the sway bar because the other side hasn't been adjusted, I went ahead and put a little bit of air inside the bag and that helped push it down. Now, from this point with the linkage disconnected, we are way too far down out of the green. So we're gonna go ahead and lengthen that linkage to get back up inside the green. I was really struggling to get the linkage adjusted long enough. And as you can tell, we've ran out of threads. So we're gonna need to cut a new piece of all thread that's longer so that way we can still have threads inside the rod ends. All right, he went ahead and cut a longer piece of all thread. That way we'll have that much more adjustability. Went ahead and cut two of these because we're gonna have to do the same thing on the other side. All righty guys, we're back into the green, so let's do the other side. All right, it's now time to set this thing up. We have got the car running, so that way when the compressor cycle, we don't have to worry about killing the battery. Now we're gonna go ahead and select our language, which is English. We wanna do our calibration. Is the vehicle on level surface? Yes. Are the front wheels straight? Yes. Is the vehicle on wheels free of obstacles? Yes. Is the manifold mounted? Yes. Do you have one or two compressors? We have two. We don't have stance guard. We have height sensors? Yes. Calibrate height manual auto. Do auto. The vehicle's gonna move and press OK. Let's check in the mounting of the ECU. Maximum pressure. We'll go ahead and set those up to 150. We make all of our changes off of height, so it's not so critical, but just so that way if he adds an extra person or extra weight and somehow it'll count for it. There we go. Now it's moving the, dumping some air out of the front, seeing how it moves. all the way up, find the height sen sensor limits. Hopefully we did our job right and get in the right range so that this programs properly. Now we're coming down. Ooh, failed. Let's see what happened. So we come in here in our height sensor tool. To get to that, we push the airlift button and the one right above it. We come in here, go to sensor tool. Let's go ahead and drop it all the way down. Let's check the rear. So it looks like my rear left and the front left are on the limit when it's all the way down. So with it showing we were, have plenty of space all the way up, that means we actually made our linkage a little bit too 
long, so if we shorten the linkage, it's gonna rotate the sensor downwards more when it's aired up, which will bring this further over to the right and to the left. So we have to raise the car back up and adjust those linkages. Alrighty, to fix that sensor error message, what we've done is we put the car back up on the rack. We've gone ahead and disconnected the linkage off of the mount on the bottom. And we need to shorten it because it was rotating the sensor too far up when we were dropping the vehicle. So what we did is we downloaded the 3P app, went ahead and connected the app to the controller. And you can see here, as of right now, we're in the red because we have adjusted we actually have it disconnected. So what we do is we shorten this up until we hit the red and we lengthen it a little bit so that way we're still in the green zone. So for the front, we're able to access it from underneath here. And for the rear, we accessed it right here. Now, if we don't have enough adjustment in the linkage, we could actually loosen the two bolts that hold the sensors and clock the sensor a little bit. And that's the same thing as adjusting the linkage. All right, now that we got those height sensors adjusted, let's go ahead and try to program this thing again. Now let's go ahead and do our calibration. It's not calibrated. It's vehicle on level surface, yes. Are the front wheels straight? Yes. Front wheels all freed of obstacles? Yes. Is the manifold mounted? Yes. One compressor or two, we have two. Stance guard, no. Height sensors, yes. We want to do a manual calibration because on this vehicle, the front lip is so low that I don't want it to get broken. Ready to move? Yes. Checking to make sure ECU is mounted. Set maximum pressure. Let's go up. So I felt it lock up. So I'm going to go ahead and set it to like 150, that should be more than sufficient for anything he does to it. Minimum pressure. Right there we felt it hit. So we'll do 40 PSI front, 50 rear. The reason why we set this is because that way we don't need to dump out and refill this air every time we lay the car out. This will help us get more life out of the tank that we have. Oh, we gotta stop it again. All right, so we're gonna try to calibrate this and we'll set the pressure low for the dropped height. I went under manual calibration, but yet still does it automatically. Let's go under max pressure again. Minimum pressure, we're gonna do not all the way down. So we're gonna set our max at, our lowest at 100. Even though this really is an ideal problem we're having is that front lip is so big. I'm trying 90. Even though the pressure is not gonna be accurate representation of the height. I don't know how this is going to work out for the programming of the unit because I would assume you'd want it to see the full travel of it. However, at this point, I don't know what else to do short of check with my airlift rep, seeing what he says, minus putting it up on blocks, if you will, so that way when it lifts up the rear with the front all the way down, we don't snap off that front end. Let it run it through, see what it does. Let's go and set our upper limit. All the way up in the front, all the way up in the back. Lower limit. go we're all the way down now we're slowly pulsing up calibration successful is ready to use great